Okay, now let us take another example. Please, slide number 17. Slide number 17. The last one. Yes. Yes. Now, this is another type of challenge that requires interpretation by economists of Sharia rules. I am asking, suppose you are an expert called upon by a country to help them draft a banking law for Islamic finance. Several countries do not have particular laws for Islamic financial institutions, and now, now they want to produce such laws. How, what will be your function as economist? Notice number one. One may think, and I have seen some draft laws doing just that, they know that many Islamic financial products and operations require the bank to own goods and then resell them. This is definitely a Sharia requirement. So an Islamic bank may well, in order to implement to abide by Sharia rules, he has to own commodities, he has to own real assets, not only the building he is uh, working in his offices, but he, ha he has the right and he needs to own real assets like stocks, bonds, uh, of uh, various uh, yani halal based uh, debt, uh, real estate, etc. Conventional banking usually restricts banks from owning any real assets. It restricts conventional banking, interest-based banking, usually constrain banks from owning real goods. Why? The answer is, they say, when you own real assets, you are exposed to commercial risks. So, if the bank is exposed to high level of risk, he may lose money for people. It will affect uh, uh, the country and other institutions, many ways, etc. So basically, the conventional rules of banking will permit the banks to own at very minimum in case they own a real asset because they have a collateral, say, and the party who uh, receives uh, some credit from them is bankrupt or unable to pay, they liquidate the collateral, maybe they end up with owning real, uh, real estate, but the central bank forces them not to keep it more than a minimum amount until they resell it. So, we have to know that this is reality of banking. Now, I have seen a draft of the banking, a draft of the banking law. The law says simply that Islamic banks are to be permitted to engage in all kinds of trade and own all kinds of assets. And the people who prepared it felt they made a good sort of successful effort if they could pass such law giving Islamic banks in their country full scope of doing all the trade and owning real assets they wish. Now, what's wrong with this? What is wrong with it is that you design this law because you ask only fuqaha and they told you this matter of owning real assets and owning goods is an essential and required part of many Islamic financing products. But not knowing the reality of banking and that all banks are supervised 
by central bank and the central bank usually wants to apply one rule on everybody. This will be short-lived, short-lived happiness. When the law is issued, maybe those who are contemplating established Islamic banks will be quite happy. The law permits them to do all the things they want to do. But because all banks had to be under the supervision of central bank, and we know, we have to know, what is on the mind of central bankers, what worries them most, what type of regulations they issue to banks throughout the world, they are very similar. We immediately realize that the central bank of that particular country will immediately send these newly established banks regulations that he applies to all others. And they will end up finding many of the things permitted by the law curtailed or prevented by regulations of central bank. The correct approach was to address these problems directly. That is, to know there are certain financing products that require the bank to own. You spell out for how long a bank may own and for what purposes, so that the, what you put in the law is something the central bank of the country can live with. But if you give a blank okay, he will issue a blank for payment and you go back to square one. Other issues also, which are related to a relationship between central bank and individual banks in the country. We know there is something called the reserve requirements all over the world under the present banking system. There are, the banks are required to hold a certain proportion of their assets as reserves. Now, some central bankers specify that part of your reserve as a bank had to be cash. Okay, so, so much cash, maybe 10% to, you have to put the cash with the central bank. Now, some central banks give interest on this cash, on the cash reserves on the digital bank. Some other central banks don't give. Now, a central banker, where his system permits him to pay interest on cash reserves of banks, will put Islamic bank at disadvantage because the Islamic bank cannot get the interest and put it in his books as profit. So it means he will have to give it to charity. So you have to address such a problem. It was not enough to say, let the Islamic bank do all the things required by Islamic financial products. You have to address the particular problems they face regarding reserves. Now, other central banks say part of your reserves may be short-term commercial paper. Well, many banks in the world, they take short-term treasury bills. It means this is interest-bearing bonds on the government. Now, a central, a, 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 an Islamic bank cannot buy such bonds and put them in as reserves. It means he has only the type of bonds he has are short-term, uh, maybe murabaha receivables. If his central bank, he may say, no, I will not accept murabaha receivables as reserves. They have to be so-so. It means you have left your Islamic bank completely uh, disadvantaged vis-a-vis -vis the other conventional banks in the country. 
what I want to conclude is that if you want to draft a banking law, you see that if you know only Sharia rules, you will produce a very inadequate law. You will end up with your Islamic banks disadvantaged in many ways because you did not know sufficiently about central banking and about the reality of that particular industry. So we come back to the same initial point. You as economists and finance people, you, you have a very valuable role to play in, in Islamic Uh, you have a very valuable role to play in helping in um, explain and implement Sharia ruling. This is your job that will complement the job of Fuqaha. It is not your duty to replicate and do the same that Fuqaha is to do. You have to do something different and useful and complementary. And I stop at this and uh, I'm ready to take questions. Okay, th thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Anas. Uh, we apologize for the many technical problems that we encountered today. Uh, but we'll ta start to uh, take questions. Uh, and let me start today with uh, Darham, if you have any questions. Durham University. Uh, we don't have any questions. Thank you. All right. Uh, Durham University, they don't have any questions. Okay, thank you. Let me move to uh, International Islamic University, Malaysia. If there is any question. Dr. Sayyid Tahir. Assalamualaikum. Alaikum First of all, remove this PowerPoint so that can see Dr. Anas and ask questions. We have on the screen PowerPoint from your side. Can you remove the answer? I don't have before Ashman, before Ashman. Anybody ask any question? Malaysia. Okay, thank you very much. So please, Stuart, anybody want to ask a question from here? Can you raise your hand? I can't hear you. Can you raise your voice? They're still trying to. Okay. okay. It seems uh, because of the interruptions, some focus has been disturbed for our students. But we really appreciate Dr. Anas' presentation. It only uh, creates one uh, puzzle in my mind. He's saying the fifth or Sharia scholars alone cannot shoulder the responsibility of success of Islamic finance. Islamic economists and other experts also have to come into the picture and play a useful role. My puzzle is at the end of the day, who will be responsible for any failures in the name of Islamic finance. Sharia scholars or the other helping hands. 